This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Monday, April 27th, and this is Kathy Neifeld with Agency One. And um, happy to welcome everybody to the first of our three-part series this week, uh, which is focusing on the state of the life insurance industry, pandemics, products, and economics, where we are and where we are going. Uh, Agency One is thrilled uh, to have as our featured speaker today, Colin Devine. Uh, Colin is a senior advisor with Health Catalyst and a principal with C. Devine and Associates. We were privileged to have Colin speak at our uh, last Agency One annual meeting, and we invited him back, and he graciously accepted our invitation. Uh, Colin is going to talk about the big picture uh, as to what's going on in the insurance industry from a financial perspective. And joining Colin today will be my partner, Gonzalo Garcia, who is going to uh, uh, say a few words, then turn this over to Colin, and it'll get uh, a little bit interactive. If you've got any questions, please remember there's a chat button. Type your questions in, and we will do our best to get to them. But uh, I don't want to take up any more time. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Gonzalo. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's safe and had a good weekend. Um, I'm pleased to have my friend Colin on the phone with us and um, Kathy already introduced you, Colin, but you were also a analyst for Citigroup way back in the day when I first met you. Um, you've been in the business for quite some time, following it very carefully. You know, I've had a lot of phone calls from a lot of advisors. And, uh, you know, everybody's a little concerned about the state of the industry uh, financially, obviously, and that's something you know uh, very, very well. Um, but, you know, before we get started, I know you've got some prepared comments and, and, and a, a couple of slides you want to share with us. But I think before we get started, I would like to ask you um, what you meant when we were preparing for this call last week. You said and I want to start off with this, is uh, that you see a massive opportunity and that the industry needed something to put a cattle prod to our behinds to get us into the 21st century from a tech standpoint. Let's start with that because I think that's absolutely fine. You know, any good news, anything that is a massive opportunity right now for us is something we absolutely want to talk about before we talk about the financial state of the industry. So maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Fair enough. And, and to clarify, the cattle prod was was to put that to the behinds of the carriers. Yeah. <laughs> so like right. the, every, yeah, the agents all have embraced technology. The carriers, yeah, as I said to you, it, 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 when I was an analyst covering the industry for what, what a part of 20 years, I never really appreciated that they were still running computer systems that are, have seen their 50th birthday, you know, and, and you know, joked, you know, they were good enough to get a man on the moon, so I guess they weren't that bad, but still, um, you know, when the iPhone wasn't around 12 years ago, you think of then, you know, there were no apps, right? How would we survive without apps today? So you start to think about um, how much technology has changed and how much our industry has not. Um, you know, I have a lot of fun these days working on the tech side, as you know. Um, I think mm -hmm. that offers tremendous upside for insurers. And that's why I think this is an opportunity, you know. It, and I've been around every part of an insurance company, and um, I think the area most resistant to change is underwriting. Um, you know, it's yeah. kind of we do it this way because we've always done it that way. Doesn't mean we should do it that way, but we've always done it that way. And you know, the, I always appreciate the quid pro quo that you know if they make a mistake, it's a 50-year mistake, or it's not. You know, and, and somebody dies really soon, and it costs them a lot of money. Um, so I get that, but the fact that you know, as you know, things like medical records, um, you know, are still going by mail or fax, um, that it takes three months to get a policy issued in today's world. Um, all it says, you know, we have to wonder why we can't grow sales, right? Sales have been what, yeah. for decades. Policy count continued to go down last year. I know sales were up a little bit, but policy count applications are down. But of course they're down. You know, nobody wants to wait three months in today's world. Gonzalo, and nobody, you know, most people don't feel like, um, you know, giving fluids and being stabbed by somebody who flunked out of medical school. You know, I mean, I'm sure all <laughs> your clients really love that paramedic exam, right? Yeah. And, and the reality is we don't need it, right? And I don't just think about technology and, and what it can do for our industry in terms of back office, you know, 
blockchain and record keeping, um, you know, front center, what it, where I think about it is what it can do for underwriting. Right. And the fact that you can use electronic medical records and, and the fact of the matter is um, you can probably eliminate about 70% of the permits. So wow. there's no reason we can't be issuing most policies in 48 to 72 hours. So, so you, so you see, Colin. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You, I mean, you see what's going on today with COVID-19 and and all of the pressure and all the disruption that's occurred just in the last 30 to 45 days, as really an opportunity for the insurance industry to change fundamentally the way they're running their companies, relative to underwriting and risk assessment. Is that and that and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as as your slides come through, and yeah. I'd like to get to those. But I mean, you see this as a real yeah. uh, fundamental shift in how we're doing business. Absolutely. I mean, albeit, you know, kicking and screaming, they're being dragged along. Right. But the, but let's face it, we're all working from home, right? Yeah. So you can't do it the old way. And by the way, let's think about, you know, how long you're going to have to wait to get that, you know, APS from a physician who's overworked trying to deal with whatever patients they can right now. You know, they've got more pressing issues than, than yeah. photocopying that up and, and, and getting it into us. So, you know, the fact of the matter is, yeah, you know, we have to change right we have people working from home um it amazes me that you know the government who i've never thought is being at the forefront of technology um social security has been using electronic medical records for benefit determination for 10 years so it's a va yeah you know. um so works just fine for them right they got lots of actual experience that that it works and as you know you're starting to see some carriers finally start to embrace this. And what I think makes it interesting, or very interesting in, in where we can grow sales, one, it's gonna create a much better customer experience, right? Because they're not most of the time getting stabbed. They can get the, you know, they go in, see you get a policy and get it out the door in a couple of days, right. right? The average time for underwriting is 10 hours. So, you know, I know it takes three months to get a policy. Underwriting is 10 hours of that, that helps frame it for everybody. Um, they're gonna get it sooner, right? Um, and I think that's how we're, and, and frankly, as you watch big data analytics come into our business, you know, this is what, you know, Facebook does, you know, um, Amazon, yeah. right? In terms of client profiling, right? The, the technology is there now to basically underwrite everybody individually, right? You don't need tables, yeah. right? There's, there's enough there literally on a post 60 certainly on somebody post 65 because you have access to the medicare medicaid database i can literally underwrite everybody individually and match them to about 400 million people wow real time well real time but that i certainly see that as an opportunity and it's going to change the game of of the insurance industry but 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 let, let, let's get to some of the slides because i know there's probably a lot of yeah. questions around What's COVID doing to the insurance companies? What's this low interest rate environment doing to them? And, and you were kind enough to ask us, you know, kind of some of the key companies that we do business with, and, and you've got some information on them. So why don't, why don't we jump into that? And then we'll, we'll take some questions as well from the people. And I'd just like to remind everybody that if you have a question, there is a chat box and I am monitoring the question. So I'll try to answer them as, as we can. Go, okay. go, go ahead, sure. Colin, Let, let's jump okay. right into this. So let's do this. Okay, so there's tremendous opportunity. What I thought I hit today, a couple things on the agenda, the state of the industry, capitalization, right? Are people going to be there to pay claims? What do interest rates mean? A lot, okay? You know, it's it, lower rates are bad for life companies. They're bad for individuals too, right? Cost of buying income, your savings has gone up. Um, but yeah, investments, we want to talk about that, you know, if we're going into a credit cycle shift. By the way, we've been there before. Industry came through it just fine. We'll talk about that. We'll look at it and then sort of looking ahead. Okay, state of the industry. All in all, I would say the industry is probably, again, overall in about the best shape it's ever been in. Okay, there certainly are some pain points, right? There's lots of capital. Liquidity has never been higher, probably too high, frankly, because you can't really have a run on the bank. Investment quality has also been high, maybe a little bit of creep for some credit risk, but the strain from low rates, right? 
that's just so think of that like slowly turning the thumb screws on the industry right because clearly we have a lot of i mean you have a lot of policies on, on the books everybody on this call does that were written not just 10 years ago but 15 years ago 20 25 and obviously rates were a lot different where you thought you were going to be investing renewal premiums was you know two three four five hundred basis points higher than today right. covid okay as we stand today and assuming uh, the powers to be, you know, in sort of um, letting go of the lockdown, don't totally mess this up and we go into, you know, an over and over scenario. COVID-19 from a mortality perspective is going to be equivalent to about a double flu, right? About 30,000 Americans die every year from the flu. I didn't know that till this. Um, and so projected you know we're going to run probably around 60,000 okay very serious on the other hand this isn't Spanish from 1918 that was 600,000 Americans died and today you know given population growth that'd be equivalent to about 1.8 um, million three times that yeah. um, the big thing for COVID of course is the macroeconomic impact right what it's done to interest rates what it looks like it's doing to the credit cycle Right, what it's already done on unemployment, which I think is at 16%, right? Numbers we haven't seen since the depression. Um, that's where the fallout's gonna come, right? It's, it's gonna be there. Um, rates, um, say, I wouldn't say rates are a solvency threat. Um, they may not make life stocks very interesting, and I know I'm not here to talk about that, but you know, if I go back to my old job, um, you know, it's going to be very hard to get anybody excited about a life insurance stock, but that does, you know, stocks in solvency are two different things. Right. Legacy liabilities. Okay. When, when you're looking at carriers and going, who's staying in this game, who's getting out of this game. All right. For everybody to think about it. a lot of what drives them is their legacy liabilities, right? The sins of the past, if you like, um, you know, that could be older blocks of variable annuities. Uh, Long-term care, I think everybody's pretty attuned to that. Um, secondary guarantee UL, right? Um, you know, that's one that's a slow creep, creep, creep. But again, you've got, you know, a guaranteed um, rate in that. You know, the Canadians used to call this term to 100 uh, back in the 80s, and it didn't work out well for them, and it's certainly not going to work out well here. So you got some problems there. And then accounting change. And, you know, folks probably don't think about this a lot. I got to live with it, but it is going to cause some, you know, headlines when you're reading the journal. Um, it may spook the rating agencies and trigger a few downgrades. Um, and so there's two ones coming down the pipe. One is credit losses, how they're measured. Um, they're going sort of from a as incurred basis to a pers perspective basis. You know, how many losses do I think I'm going to take? Not mm -hmm. how many, you know, I'm booking them as I come. Well, the you know credit cycles turn, then my outlook for lots is clearly has to change because right now in things like commercial mortgages they've been none, um, so they're likely going to be up. Um, the other one that's out there is this thing called the long duration standard. And again, I don't want to bore everybody to tears, but if they're trying to figure out how does a company like General Electric is going along just fine, end of eighteen. Oops, the wheels go off the bus on long-term care, and they book a you know ten billion dollar charge, and and you're going what what the heck, you know, um, where's that coming from, and why are some other companies maybe trading at you know fifteen percent of book value? It's because there's a flawed accounting. Um, certain types of liabilities, which long-term care is one, go, stay on an insurance company's books at their original underwriting assumptions. Okay, even if they're from 15 years ago, when rates were higher, assume lapses were higher, they only needed the morbidity. Um, so they could be totally out of touch with reality. And under current accounting, they stay like that until your future cash flow projections go a dollar negative. Dollar positive, you can't change the assumptions. Dollar negative, you mark on the market. You mark on the market, you saw what happened at General Electric, 10 billion charge. Um, You've only seen this type of thing really happen three times. And in all the cases, one of which would be um, Penn Treaty, which is under rehabilitation, companies have basically had to triple reserve. So that's an issue out there. This new long duration standard, bottom line, 
it's going to do away with that. All liabilities are going to be treated the same. They're basically going to be marked to market. But when that happens, there's going to be multi-billion dollar charges coming on some companies. So credit losses are effective this year. The long duration standard is going to hit at the beginning of 2022. Stay tuned. Um, companies are preparing for it now. So as you watch carriers or think about them, you know, you don't have to explain to the client why did, you know, say it was General Electric. They just take a $10 million charge, right? Your client's going to freak out. Um, stay tuned. Okay. Yep. So there's certain liabilities you got to watch. Okay. All right. Oops, we'll go down. Okay. So capitalization. Okay. Um, most people probably have heard of RBC or risk based capital. It's a ratio that compares how much capital a company has with how much regulators think they need. Okay. It's one tool regulators use. Unfortunately, it's certainly on Wall Street, it's become the primary tool. The rating agencies all have their own version of this. Um, it basically applies risk factors and it looks at things. I, I try to put it there. Um, basically, you know, your affiliates, your investment portfolio, your underwriting mortality morbidity, C3 is interest rates, and C4 is business risk. Okay. The biggest driver, okay, is C1 or the investment portfolio. Okay. RBC, and again, the rating agencies all have very similar models, right? I used to work for SP long before I came to Wall Street. Okay. They all sort of their actions are governed by what happened to them in the past. And so what their institutional memory is all about investments. Right? Regulators, it's all about investments, which is why investment risk is the biggest driver of RBC. Right. In an economic downturn, what are you starting to see? Bond downgrades. Okay. Right? The lower the rate of the bond, the more capital got a hold. Even if you don't have defaults. Okay. Commercial mortgage defaults, they start hitting. What's going to happen then is that C1 charge is going to go up. RBC ratios are going to come down. Okay, that's going to impact stock prices, but that's also potentially going to impact credit ratings. So something to think about that's out there, right? Now, what does it mean as we look at companies? Okay, so let's go down. Okay. Um, we're going to go to the next slide and sort of looks. Um, average RBC levels, as I said, for the industry uh, after five years, four years of modest declines, overall went up. Uh, the mutual is averaged about 520 last year. Uh, stock insurance 426. And I would view 425 to 475 as double A. So very strong. Okay. Um, but looking out, you got to think it. You know, it's going to start to trend down out of COVID, and depending on the company, you know, maybe that triggers a rating action, even if it's just a credit watch. So be warned. Okay. Um, here's what it looks like. Okay, there's the industry walking back to 2002. Uh, RBC started in 93. If I watch it right back to that, uh, those numbers started at about 250%. That's when I came into the industry. So you can see they've definitely built up capital, it's been stable. They're well positioned to withstand this. That's why I say there's nothing that should be a solvency event, but that doesn't mean there couldn't be a rating downgrade or two, or companies, you know, have to do some repositioning. So, okay. hey, Colin, Colin, got uh, a okay. quick question here. Um, just go back to the previous slide, if, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, the, so you're talking about, you know, 425 to 475 of RBC is really a, a double A rated company. Um, I mean, th there are some very meaningful redundancies on the mutual side and mutual companies. Certainly the, the stock companies seem to be right at the lower end of that 425 to 475 range um, mm -hmm. on average. Uh, do, do you see, as a result of some of the things that are happening, um, any meaningful reductions overall? And do you see them differently for stock or mutuals? Um, I think, you know, Gonzalo, RBC ratios for both companies, if I have to go, where's 2020 going to end? Mm. They're going to be down. Okay. They're going to come down because of bond downgrades, you know, mortgage defaults. Um, the NEIC, so the insurance regulators, are still trying to put in place a new system for assessing bonds. Mm. Um, that's also going to require more capital. Um, you know, it's interesting because I would tell you, 
I think the biggest driver of a life company's earnings, solvency, capital is interest rates, right? And then that that was number four on the list in terms of, yeah. of, of yeah. how the model works. So I don't think this is a perfect model. It is what it is, but what I can tell you is its pressure point is investments, investment quality turns, and these ratios are coming down right. depending on the company. Uh, they're you know they're going to be coming down on S and P or Best or Moody's capital models as well, and if they go over you know certain triggers. You could see yep. some rating action. Okay. Well, um, let's take a look at some of the companies yeah. that we're yeah. we're working yeah. we're working with currently. Yeah. Which I think yeah. is your next would, slide. Sure. I would just add to you that why you see a difference between mutuals and stock companies. You know, stock companies are run for the benefit of shareholders, and mutuals mm -hmm. obviously policyholders. So, sure. you know, shareholders care about ROE that keeps stock prices up. So, that's the difference there. Okay. So there's yep. uh, you asked me to pull it up for um, you know your top companies, the 10 of them. So there you can see, um, you know, nationwide off the charts, um, actually had the highest, it has highest RBC of any of the 62 insurance groups I looked at. Um, you know, there were definitely a bunch lower than AIG at 350. Um, you know, that is just for AIG's life business. I, you know, I, I say you gotta keep this all in context. You know, when you're looking at a company as diversified as AIG, you know, all the PC business, all the, and by the way, RBC is solely focused on their U.S. businesses, right? So, may not John Hancock. There's nothing in that RBC really for the benefit of the parent, Manulife. Sumitomo Symmetra, there's nothing in there for the benefit of Sumitomo. Okay, same with Daiichi Protective. So, again, you want to bear that in mind. You know, I look at this. All the companies you're looking at have solid RBCs, none of which should be any sort of regulatory issue in anything that's foreseeable out of COVID, either from a mortality perspective or an investment quality perspective as we stand here today. Right. You know, AIG may be not doing stock buybacks, but there, you know, there may be a lot of reasons they don't do that. Um, yeah, it, it, Colin, is, is, there, is there a point in time when too much reserve capital is, you know, a dumb balance sheet, so to speak? I mean, is it just, you don't, you're reserving too much and you don't have enough for other opportunities or initiatives or other growth uh, things that you may be looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, cause you can, you know, again, I guess it just becomes, you know, the stock or mutual, you know, nationwide will go six, nine, is just fine because our policyholders, you know, we've got so much capital, it's wonderful, but you could say, that's also inefficient. So you could look at it two ways, right? Versus, you know, the principal Sumitomo's manualized sort of, you know, the guys are around 425. That's running a, you know, a very efficient balance sheet. That's about the number you want to be at. And and that's so, more important for a stock company than a mutual company, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the amount of cat, it's ROE, right? So if I can right. reduce the E, keep the R up, the ROE is higher and my stock price goes up. Sure. And that's why sure. you see the difference, right? Got it. Got it. Yep, but that's why you'll see higher RBCs for mutuals because you know they're run for the benefit of the policyholders, not not mm -hmm. shareholders. Okay, interest rates. Okay, to frame this, you know, I know it seems like forever. Um, you know, ten year was five percent during our lifetime. I uh, sorry, um, back in two thousand and six. Um, you know, so many of these companies thought uh, I'd never go below three, never go below two. <laughs> Here we are at sixty basis points. You know, thirteen years in for this. Is it low for long, low for forever? Um, I'm the bear. I think rates are not going anywhere for as far as any of us can forecast out. Okay. Um, and I'll go out there and tell you that's probably the next 10 years. You know, that maybe you get the 10 year back to 2%, but there's so much money in the system right now. Um, that's going to be tough. And so, what does it mean for insurers? It means a couple things. One, Pressure because you're putting up renewal premiums where you didn't, you know, well below where you thought. But where you can also have the big shock, um, you know, when they reserve, they set reserves with a certain forward interest rate assumption. Um, if you do what's called a scenario shift, so instead of say assuming, well, the 10 year is going to get back to 5% in 10 years, the 10 year, you go, no, the 10 year is going to stay at 3% in 10 years. That means you're under reserved and you're going to take some charges. So 
I think you're going to see that this year. Um, you know, they've kept hoping and hoping and hoping rates are going to rise. Um, obviously, they haven't. Um, you know, rates are down even from the end of 18, probably about 150 basis points. Mm. Um, credit spreads have widened a little bit to offset that, but but not that much. So, you know, you have to start looking at going. The accountants and auditors are going to be on them and going, you know what? No, the, you know, the 10 years not going back to five. You better assume it's three. And if you assume it's three, you need more reserves. Yep. So there's going to be well, some and, and that's causing all sorts of issues with the companies. I mean, you address it in your last bullet point, but, you know, we're also seeing things like companies limiting dramatically the amount of uh, 1035s or single premium dump-ins they're taking, uh, limiting the amount coming in on yeah. annuities and other products and certainly, um, you know, single act premium. So that that's a big thing, but there's other things that they're doing and, and, and you talk about that stopping certain products and so on. So that that's meaningful. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, get ready for this. It's going to be stopping sales. It's going to be divestitures. Right, it's mm -hmm. not the first time anybody on this, you know, phone's been to that rodeo. Um, you know, I own a Bright House variable annuity. You know, that's fine, except I thought it was buying MetLife. You know, what happened? Right? Um, I have I have a Voya one. Well, I, that's venerable now. <laughs> Hold on. You know, like let's there's you know things have changed here. Um, you know that I didn't necessarily sign up for. Um, and you're certainly going to see more of that. Um, you know, COI increases. You know. I, I, you know, I have several emails I could I could share with you that that told me hell would freeze over before they up the COI. Well, I guess it's a little chilly out there yeah, right now. They have no they have no <laughs> more levers to pull. They, they, there's just no more levers they can pull. They have no no right. yield spread. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, in 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 terms of options, right? I mean, you know, we, we talked the other day a little bit about the the dichotomy of 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 um, decisions made by, and I'm going to call them out you know, Prudential gets out of the 30 year term market and protective introduces a 40 year term policy. Yeah. Um, w w why such a bipolar response to the market relative to long duration guarantees on term products? Um, and as I said to you at the time, what I think it reflects is, you know, you've got two very astute companies, um, but they have two very different books from a, from a risk perspective. Mm -hmm. And all I would assume is, you know, as you know, Pru um, has a big pension risk transfer business, right? right? Remember, they've done some of those massive deals like AT&T, you know, there's two they did a couple of years back, I think came to about $28 billion. I mean, they're, you know, those are massive deals. Um, it may feel that they just have enough exposure there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, protective on the other hand, um, again, you think of most of their life exposure are term blocks they've purchased. Probably most of that is 10 to 20, right? Yep. Um, they've got a parent, you know, that's, that loves mortality risk, that loves very long dated mortality risk. And so, again, I think that's just, again, everybody's got an appetite. They're looking at global books and, and Protective is now obviously part of something bigger in Daiichi, you know, and, and they're balancing it that way. But they're, but they're both, each of them, I would consider one of the more, astute risk managers right. so it's not by accident but if you had to guess or speculate i should say it would be that they're just looking at their overall yeah. book right and, and i just wanted to point that question out because i you know and i get it from a number of folks that i talk to it's yeah. there's nothing inherently wrong with getting out of the 30-year term business or adding a 40-year term product it's just the companies are yeah. just run differently and they have different financials so yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to make a point that there, yeah. there's nothing wrong with either company right there's nothing wrong at all. I mean, you know, protective is not in the pension risk transfer business. Yeah, yeah. And yet, for Pru, that's fifteen to twenty percent of the company, right? Yeah. So again, it's just a question of where you are and what your right. overall book looks like. So Great. Know, that, that's the biggest thing. But it, yeah, a, these options are not going to change. <laughs> We're we're closing in on on time, and I did want to ask uh, you one. I know you've got one more thing you wanted to cover here at the end, but yeah. I did want to ask you one final question, and I'll I'll let you kind of go through these quickly, and then we'll we'll yeah. we'll finish up with a question. Okay. So as I mentioned, there's average investment yields coming down. You know, companies have done a better. You know, I've slowed it, but steadily mm -hmm. down. You can see what rates have done. Okay. Investments, like I said, investment risk has been stable 
Okay, nobody's had any losses, right? We had the best credit market we've seen in probably in 20 years. Okay, everybody can get these slides. That's what the mix, you know, bottom line, life companies are mostly investor grade bonds, very little on high yield, 3.6%, very little on equities, right? Okay, 11% of commercial mortgages. These are very conservative portfolios, okay? There's another way to look at, when I looked at high risk assets at the rating agency, we sort of looked at, you know, below investment grade, common equities, real estate, and, and other like hedge funds, you can see it's been very stable at about 8%, right? It really, yeah. you know, there's nobody out there on a limb, okay? Credit loss is okay. So, it's, you know, if this thing goes south, what's going on? The industry has been to this rodeo before. You can see in 2009, okay, yeah, we took a lot of credit losses. Otherwise, they were pretty stable, right? And the industry kept going. Nobody went down, right? AIG's issues had nothing to do with this insurance business. As policyholders are never at risk. Right, it's a completely separate thing that would have impacted shareholders, but not policyholders. Okay, this industry can take investment losses. It's like the old Timex, you know, um, slogan: "Takes a lick and keeps on picking." We can we can take that because we have cash flow, right? That cash flow keeps coming in. That's what gets them through troubles. Okay, yeah. so look it up. Demographics are great. Capital investments, yes, we're gonna we're gonna take a few shots, but we can drive right through that. Not, I don't see any COVID-driven failures. Technology is where the opportunity is coming. Thank God, finally we're we're going to get into. I'd be happy if we got in the last century, you know, alone, you know, this century. Yeah. But hey, you know, hope springs eternal. We're getting there, and, and you're seeing some of that. And then I'll just leave this for who thinks we have it, things things change. You know, here's a list of companies where are they now. You know, so as much yeah. as it seems like we haven't been through this, I to mention, yeah, we've seen a lot of change. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, and I've been in this business long enough to know that I did business with almost every <laughs> single one of those yeah. companies. So, um, you, you know, Colin, so so just in conclusion, because I think a lot of people dial into this to, to, to see really, you know, one of the things that, that we wanted to ask you is, you know, if, if you were in sales, if you were in production today, um, what, sh you know, two quick questions. What should you be concerned about? And what should you be capitalizing on? Um, I'll tell you, I, the first thing I would say is it's not all about price. Right? I, would, mm -hmm. I, would, I would focus on the companies, am I, if, am I comfortable with the strategy, right? their capital position, right? and that they're going to be there for the long haul, recognizing there will be some things that you can't foresee, such as MetLife spinning off its individual business. right? And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, Sprite House is not mad. So, but I would definitely be thinking about that. Um, I would say mutual companies in general are less likely to do that than stock companies. Okay, mm -hmm. but there's no guarantees um, on that. And then the second thing I would focus on is companies that are starting to embrace technology, right? We've got to generate sales, right? Americans maybe are figuring out they really do need life insurance. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, one of the other things I am is an advisor for the Alliance for Lifetime Income. They need retirement yep. income planning desperately. Um, but we've got to make these products easier to buy, right, uh, without the stabbing in the paramed. Um, and I would be looking at companies that are embracing technology because they're going to help you drive sales, right? They're going to help yep. you get it right, punch that ticket for your client. They're going to help you upsell the client and identify other needs. So I need companies that I believe are, are there to go the distance and I need companies that can embrace technology and aren't afraid of it. Got it. Got it. Um, there's one quick question from the, well, two quick questions here. Uh, thoughts on Phoenix life. Um, I haven't really looked at Phoenix, so I couldn't comment. Right. If I, if I recall, isn't Got that it. owned by one of the hedge funds now? Yeah. Yeah. But there's and an then, example uh, of how things change, right? There's another one, how things change. Right. And then uh, our whole life from mutuals more at risk than other policies. Did you hear that, Colin? Colin froze. Let's give it a second to see if he comes back. Colin, you're uh, frozen. Hey Gonzalo, I'm going to text him. Hold on one second. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would. Um, I, I'll just kind of begin to bring this to a conclusion for those that are left on the call. Um, Colin wrote a a great um, paper. Uh, he, he he wrote it with Milliman on uh, annuities. 
Um, he also wrote a great article in CNBC that uh, we will be glad to share with all the people on the call, uh, specifically around annuities. And he's been very active in this, um, uh, you know, annu annuity space in the in the Institute for Retirement Income. Uh, so he's very passionate about that. Um, I would uh, doesn't look like we're going to get him back. That's just one of the realities of today's world and working with this technology. Um, but I would like to thank everybody that was on the call. Um, and I would like to uh, thank, obviously, Colin, who I believe at this point has dropped off. Um, Colin, for being on the phone with us uh, for this. And uh, everybody have a great day. Kathy, back to you. Thank you, Gonzalo. And uh, Colin, again, thank you if you're trying to dial back in or back on. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel please feel free to reach out to myself or to Gonzalo. If Agency One can help you with anything, again, uh, reach out to uh, your case managers or any of the uh, great folks at Agency One. I want to remind everyone that our next webinar is going to be Wednesday at 12 noon, continuing with this series on uh, what's happening in the environment. Uh, Wednesday's WebEx is going to be the future of life insurance products in a post-COVID-19 and low interest rate environment. And we are pleased to uh, have Nate Shellhouse, who is an actuary with Principal Financial Group, uh, lead the conversation. So we hope that you will join us again on Wednesday. And um, everybody have a safe and uh, healthy week. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Colin? I know you just dialed back in. We just said our goodbyes. <laughs> so, and we can't hear you. So, Colin, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Well All right.